Hello and welcome to IoT Testing, a Crash Course. Uh, I am Tim Jensen, also known as Eapol Sniper. I will be discussing things with you today. So, standard DEF CON style disclaimer, uh, the presentation is being given by myself on a voluntary basis without any warranty. This presentation does not represent any of my past or present employers, and all examples given in this presentation are common IoT issues and do not relate to a single product, service, or customer tested during my career. So a little bit about me, uh, I attended my first 2600 meeting in 1999, which is definitely making me feel old the longer this goes. I've been an InfoSec for about nine years professionally, mostly in pen test consulting. Uh, I've done about five years of server admin and software development uh, prior to that. I co-owned and operated a hack lab in Fargo, North Dakota for four years, where I conducted broad information security training and hardware hacking training. And have a number of popular certifications including CISSP, OSCP, and CREST CRT for anybody from the UK might know that one. Uh, and pen testing that I'm good at, uh, network, IoT, and web app are my main bread and butter. So what is IoT? You're probably panicking right now because I'm going very overhead but uh, I think this is important to, to think of. So anything IoT is really a device that is connecting back to the cloud to uh, process data, store data, or allow connectivity to your devices internally. So things like on the screen here, I have a couple of Ring cameras. So they do very little processing locally. They send the streams up into the cloud. The cloud processes your data. You connect to the cloud from your phone or computer. You never really connect directly to the devices. Same with like the garage door opener. Uh, that allows you to connect to the cloud and open and close your door and see the status of your door, which is very convenient. But when you have things like access control, like uh, you know locks on your doors and garage door openers, you start having very real security concerns if you can manipulate this, because obviously somebody can break into your house or business and that is definitely not good. So whenever we're talking IoT, just keep in mind we're talking about anything that's really connecting back out to the internet to process data or allow access. So the first thing that I really stress with any sort of IoT testing is mapping functionality. Uh, this is passed over a lot during testing. So you want to take a look at the device and see what all it's connecting to, what protocols it has enabled. So let's take this uh, little camera here. So the camera, if you scan it, so it's going to get an IP. If you scan that IP, you're going to see multiple ports that are open. Uh, being a Nest camera, it's not going to actually have much, but uh, a lot of cameras will have Telnet or SSH or something of that nature open and multiple video port protocol ports uh, for streaming video. Uh, all sorts of fun things can be open. Um, so mapping that functionality, you'd want to put all that data in. You want to know, yes, it's connecting to Wi-Fi, it's not hardwired, so now we have Wi-Fi in scope, and the uh, devices that connect to the Wi-Fi and then back up to the cloud and then back to get that data. We have the API between the cloud servers and the device. Uh, things that also get passed over a lot is now all of the third-party components that are being connected to, both directly from the device as well as from the cloud servers, if you can figure that out. Uh, and it's interesting to look at that for a security perspective of where your data is going and do you really know what's happening to it. Uh, sometimes you can tell that because people want to do less and less on their side and they push it down to the client and uh, if, if your device can handle those third-party connections uh, they will try to have it do so. Um, some things that can get kind of fun here with uh, when you're mapping up functionality. So a camera here isn't as complex. Uh, today while uh, shooting this presentation I use Asus ROG uh, Republic of Gamer routers and the laptop I'm on is a very new Asus ROG laptop and I figured out for some reason when uh, I get Windows updates applied to my Asus ROG laptop uh, my router resets and reboots itself on the next start of the Windows machine. So now we have a connected device using protocols between the, the different ROG components, which I did know were connected, uh, but I did not know that restarting one basically is restarting another. So when we get back into IoT testing and looking at IoT devices, uh, that can actually be of similar vein where one device might tell another device something to do and you might need to look at a multiple collection of devices to really understand what functionality is actually there.
So we're going to just jump right in here and I'm stepping back one step here. Uh, the point of this talk and what I want to do is uh, basically describe if you're already a penetration tester of any discipline, kind of talking about what different disciplines and how they tie together. So like you can do web app interfaces, you can do network testing, uh, you can do code review, you can do appy testing, uh, you can do physical testing on these and hardware testing. Uh, so kind of if you've never done the full IoT testing before, kind of just some tips and hints to pull that te all those testing disciplines together and kind of give you a little bit of a jump forward uh, if you're just starting out in IoT testing. So uh, first things first, you get a device, what are you going to do with the device? Um, so hey, I'm holding a you know random IoT device, so what can we do with it? Um, or maybe you don't even have the device, and actually I like to test a lot of devices that I don't even have. Um, so the first thing that you want to do is see if the firmware is publicly available and uh, if it's encrypted. So what you can do is you can go down to the internet and we are going to use for some examples here this ASUS RT-AC66U uh, router which is my old router that is no longer in use. Uh, so we can take a look at this router here and if you've ever noticed and you know tried to un update firmware on any IoT devices or routers or whatever uh, you can just go out online usually and see that the firmware is available and we see here hey we've got a new one from February 5th 2021 and we can even see hey look at all the CVs and stuff that was fixed that's convenient so what we can do is just download this firmware and that's what we're going to play with today is just to try to figure out how to really get into the weeds of IoT. Uh, one thing to point out though is whenever you're doing pen testing you can look at what's in this version but make sure to hit like the see all and now you can go between all the different versions. If you pull these down as I'll show you in a minute you're going to get very detailed access into these files and into the source code and you can take the source code between these two and diff that source code out and you're going to find where these directory reversal vulnerabilities were, where these cross-site scriptings were, that's going to be very easy for you to figure out. Um, so always make sure to look at the last couple uh, versions to see kind of what vulnerabilities were there and you might be able to track out, track down some new vulnerabilities or see if those are duplicated in other areas that weren't caught. So I've already pre-downloaded this firmware here for the, for the ASUS router. So if we go in to my Kali machine and take a look, I have an IoT lab set up here. And we can see here is our ASUS router firmware. It's RTAC66U, the version, and a .trx file. So all that you need to do, in theory, is do binwalk-e-m and then put in your file there and hit enter. So this E is extract. The dash M means that it's going to keep extracting subfiles. And what that means is if you go into this directory that I've already extracted and you look, here's a 7-zip, here's a squash FS, here's squash FS root. If you did not do that dash M, you're not going to get this squash FS root. Uh, because these have not been extracted. So the dash M is recursively extracting over and over and over again, which is very important. So if we run that here, bin walk is literally walking the bin and dumping out a bunch of num wonderful things. So it can see it's a TRX firmware header, it has LZMA compressed, it has a squash FS file system, as we had seen before in those directories up here, squash fs. And then we can see, hey, it's doing things. Wonderful, wonderful things. And if we do an ls here, we have another directory that got opened up because I've run it twice now. So if we go into this, Again, we can see those files that we saw before. If we go to the squash fs root, we have the entire file system that's on the device. Now you will notice that some things are missing. So slash etc slash home. 
if you look these are broken links so they're all going to slash temp so if you go to temp you'll notice that's blank so we will get into that in a minute but just so you know from bin walk that could mean that something is not decompressing or it could mean something else that we get into but what you want to make sure on is when you're doing bin walk, the number one problem people have with uh, bin decompressions and walking them is not reading for errors. So let's go back to the document here. So we see bin walk common issues here. You'll get an error, no such file or directory, LZOP. Error, no such directory is Yuba read extract files. Kali is very bad with binwalk. It's broken out of the box 100% of the time as far as I've been able to tell. So always go to the GitHub for the Refirm Labs, the binwalk itself, and look at the dependency file. I've also not had luck running it. Uh, there's a combined file that you can run to install the dependencies. That does not work. I manually install for whichever packages are missing and it is a very important step. If you miss things, you're not gonna get anything. And the problem is, it's hard to tell sometimes what's an error and what's not if you don't read that. So for example, if we go back out here, and we do dash E dash M on this FP. So this FP V300.min, this is for a business security camera that I pulled offline. And if we run bin walk on that, Do, 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 do. So it says, hey, there's LZ4 compressed data. There's some MySQL stuff. And when we look, there's nothing. And the reason for that is uh, all of those files are encrypted. So without being able to decrypt this firmware, uh, you're not gonna get anything. So if you don't read those errors, you might think, hey, it's encrypted versus your bin walk just isn't set up properly. And that's a major problem. Um, you can get this same issue with things like uh, this Avert X IP camera. If we've been walk that one, so this one really looks like it's doing stuff. So we've got a bunch of different stuff going on here. We're not seeing any errors, which is good. And we've scanned everything through. And if we go to the extracted firmware, we see there's a 0.zip in this PA. If we go into the PA, hey, we have a U image extracted. And where I would expect files to be, the CPIO root. And root again, there is nothing. So chaining down and going extraction, extraction, extraction as it's recursively digging through. Uh, there were files to expand, but when we actually got to anything that we really wanted, uh, it was all encrypted. And by the way, if you're on the device manufacturer side, I say encryption is the number one thing you can do to protect your device. Uh, you should be giving unencrypted to your pen testers and bug bounty people to do testing. But for the general public, uh, encrypting and signing your, your firmware updates is very important and preferably not just handing them out on a web page either. So make it download through the device or go through a support portal for registered users that are confirmed users of the device. All right, so that's kind of our little opener into Binwalk here. One big important step. Binwalk Sasquatch. This is probably the most important package for Binwalk and it has been broken for years. Uh, so to get it installed, you have to run this app to get installed. This is in that dependency instruction, get clone. But to build, this is not in that instruction, you need to add this before the dot slash build or your build will fail. If you don't have that, you're not binwalking. So make sure to uh, note that down in your IoT handbook. Uh, 
to use that in the future whenever you're setting up an environment. So navigating file systems. Uh, so just going to touch a little bit on this. Uh, we already touched on successful versus failed bin walks. So let's go back to that broken links where I was talking about that. So there's two ways that you get these broken links. One is, and this is the most common in my opinion, when the device is flashed initially, all of these locations are created. And when this is broken, these updates, they don't want to overwrite those files, such as uh, your Etsy directory that has all of the main configurations and the like. Uh, so it won't upgrade or overwrite all those files with your passwords, your configurations, things of that nature. So they leave those out intentionally. The other option is it could be an application that runs that will then generate these directories and these files inside, uh, which is actually one of the cases, it's kind of a split with this device. Some of it, I believe, is missing intentionally, uh, and others get built with a file. But once you have this firmware here, just so you know, we can look at a number of different things, even though we don't have everything. So what we would like is slash Etsy password and Etsy shadow. That would be very convenient to have so we could see what passwords are on here. This is before the device is set up. So if a password works here and then it works after you've configured the device, you know that that's static. Uh, as well as if it works here before a setup uh, and it works on a device you have running, you know that that's the same on every device. So that would be a very good vulnerability to have from a pen test perspective. Uh, cache credentials like that is bad. Um, but we can also go into www here and we can see all of the files running on the system. This is very useful so if we want to I mean we can tear apart anything right and look at how it's handling authentication everything of that nature so it was QIS I believe let's do QIS admin pass here and we can see the server side code that's taking a look at some things So we have different username values that are hard-coded. Root guest and anonymous. If I find it here or not, I also found some passwords that it does not accept, or at least does not let you set new. I'm not sure if I'm going to find that while we're in demo god mode here. And I don't want to waste too much time, but you can go through this code and you can go through all of it and take a look. Uh, one important thing is you can actually pull this all off and move it to your own server as well and actually run run the code off device. So just set up another web server and you can be running the device code and take a look and play without working on a device itself. Um, one very important thing with IoT devices is they're small microchips. So if you think of like you're running this not even on a Raspberry Pi, uh, maybe more of an Arduino level hardware. So doing any sort of scanning can crash the device. So, so we're kind of talking about the broken links and why, reviewing the static OS credentials. Uh, reviewing installed applications gets missed by a lot of people. Um, so we're going to take a look at that real quick. So if we look at bin, everything that they put on is taking space. So you want to see what people are putting and why to see if there's anything weird, especially any server components that might open or close ports, and then you're going to want to scan the system to figure out why it's there. So if Telnet's here, SSH is here, um, anything of that nature. But you can get into some fun. So here, SBIN, obviously we're seeing some more kind of fun stuff. You know, Syslog is on here, which you expect for a router. But we see these ASUS is here, and ASUS LP, ASUS SD, S G, S, R, T, T, Y. We can run strings on this. And you can kind of go through and see what these, they're binary files, but you're trying to figure out kind of what they do. And I'll just cheat here a little bit because I already know what's there that I'm looking for.
So if we see here, we're searching for Etsy shadow and we're looking for three lines above and three lines below. And what we start seeing here is we're looking at Etsy shadow and here's the actual shadow lines and it's building the Etsy shadow file from this command. So where I was saying that sometimes the file system is built after the startup of the device and sometimes it's flashed on there and you're updating with these firmwares. This is what I'm talking about with it's being created afterwards. If we start looking at this, it's taking a percent %s, which from just a cursory look, appears that it may actually be a user input. Uh, and if we're taking that user input and putting it in, can we take that from the device and add that in and actually do command injection? That might be a possibility. If we can write this whole command out and have it run a command and then just do a comment line to comment out the rest of this, that's just normal overwriting command injection kind of stuff. So some of these kind of commands like this can really open up a lot of possibilities uh, which you would not see from just looking externally on the device. But when we start looking at how the setup works in the back end and doing the code review, you can find a lot of cool stuff. So reviewing cron jobs, unfortunately without the device running, there's no cron job set up and I couldn't actually find anything running cron jobs, uh, which is interesting on a router. I normally see that. Um, and also not seen on this, but I see it a lot, is look for any artifacts left over from the device testers. I usually see a lot of log files or even uh, like dot test or something uh, where they're actually leaving test artifacts, which may have credentials to test environments. It may just leak a bunch of other information that shouldn't be left around. But if you can get that information, it's really handy sometimes in a pen test uh, to see if you can break out and attack the cloud systems with that information. All right, so going on to API connections. So I think API connections are probably the most important thing to test on an IoT, uh, and a lot of times it doesn't get tested. And this is where you need to be either doing a penetration test, be an internal tester for the company, or be a bug bounty person with it in scope. Because if you're attacking the API, you're attacking their cloud servers, and if you do this without authorization, you could be in a lot of trouble. So well, there are some passive, passive things that you can look at and some active. Passive is generally probably going to be considered safe to test. Uh, active is generally not going to end well if you don't have a contract. So you can look at the code and do a code review of how the initial connections are set up. Uh, so that can be very interesting with devices. Something like a Nest camera, you have an account and you add your device to your account and when you do that, your API key is for your user and that makes sense. Uh, some devices that I've seen do this very weirdly. So I've actually seen some devices that every device gets the same API key and you send basically the serial number of your device through uh, up to the cloud server and that's how you access your data and the serial number of the devices are oftentimes a MAC address or something of that nature so they're predictable and if you start rotating those through you're accessing other people's data um, they're usually done on uh, less sophisticated devices that way obviously but I've seen quite a few out there like that but there can be a lot of other issues as well um, so kind of trying to figure out how that connection is set up, read through the code, look for logic issues. Since most people aren't looking at that code, it's very commonly missed uh, if you have an issue there. So it's, a, it's pretty much the first thing that I look for. Um, so again, does everybody get the same API key? Uh, how does each device interact with the API? So try to get three devices going and if you can see their API keys, uh, see are they all the same? Uh, are they predictable? Um, what kind of data is being sent that differentiates the connections. And then also doing the code review on the device, uh, look for any API methods that are out there that you can enumerate. So what all functions can you connect to? You might not see all of them going back and forth all the time. So uh, look in the code to see if there's anything that's in the code for testing purposes or things of that nature that's not normally in use. Uh, pull that out and play with it. You can fuzz, this goes back to the active, so you can fuzz API methods uh, and you know try to discover new features. So Burp Suite has a, has a lot of fun with that and you just get a list of different methods to try to dump through. Uh, removing authentication methods entirely. I see this a lot on IoT connections and I think it's a test thing. They forget to 
set it as required in production. Uh, but I have seen this on probably 25% of the IoT products that I've tested over my career. Uh, if you just remove the authentication methods entirely from the connection, uh, it will give you some level of access. Sometimes it's administrator, sometimes you just get access to an organization if you leave the org in there, uh, but it's kind of scary how often that works. Um, and then also check the server for a WSDL that will define all of the methods in scope. Uh, or sometimes you'll see if you scan that server, you'll find Postman files or weird stuff out there that's going to define that. Or just check for other documentation that might define all of the different methods for the API. Um, also, don't forget to check, because I see this a lot, test or QA environments exposed to the internet. And again, check all of those if there's any documentation, WSDLs, anything of that nature out there. You might be able to pull all of that from a test or QA environment that's exposed for testing between manufacturers and partners. And if you can do that, you can use that against production. So when we're looking code review on a device, so the great thing again, bin walk, dump out, we get to see all that wonderful code. You're looking for default credentials uh, and backdoors. You see this a lot. Backdoors get left in a lot for testing uh, as well as for administration later. If somebody calls in and, you know, I've got this critical problem with my device, they might have a backdoor to get into it for, for support. Uh, default credentials is more of a thing that authentication gets screwed up a lot. That's kind of why we're all in pen testing and security is this is a consistent problem. So looking for credentials that don't roll over upon device setup or get missed or just generally weak um, and, and can still be used, uh, look for all of that kind of stuff. Uh, authentication logic failures happen a lot. Uh, again, so when you put in usernames and passwords, how is it actually handling that going into the code? Can you break out of things? Can you bypass authentication? Um, are other applications stored in backup directories? So sometimes they'll have five versions of the device in a web directory, and you can go back through the different versions, and if you know vulnerabilities are in those, you can look that up. Or again, you can look if there's default credentials in those. Sometimes you can reset a device by going to slash back slash you know, index.html and it will get you back to that new user setup and now you can roll over the device and take it over uh, from whoever had it set up before. Um, and again, test code left behind quite often. I had something else I was going to say on code review and I am blanking it at the moment, so unfortunately we're missing it. Alright, so uh, Sometimes you want to go from firmware to interactive. So ideally, if you're pen testing, you have a device. So downstairs, I have my router. I can pick it up. I can play with it. I can run Nmap against it. I can run Nessus against it. Uh, all that kind of fun stuff. That is awesome. Sometimes you don't have that. Um, you can use QMU to emulate the firmware. It is a royal pain. It is such a royal pain that some people made a Firmidine, it's called. And Firmidine, you can load in that firmware file and it will try to emulate the device and run it in a virtual machine that again is very similar to the actual device itself. You're going to be missing some hardware connections obviously to real physical components but in general it will be the same. Uh, Cumio and Firmidine is an art to get working and on a time crunch for a pen test it can be a pain so don't spend a ton of time on it. I like to look for the code review stuff and have a physical device. I do not like to test entirely in an emulated environment. It is not a good test. Uh, but as I had said before, you can also just steal the files and move it to a running Linux instance. So steal those www files and steal those sbin files if you can and uh, try to get that going. Stealing those sbin files, you're going to run into some architecture complications because these devices are running on ARM or other embedded hardware. But the www files are just going to be any transportable PHP whatever, so those should be able to be be able to be run very easily, and at least you'll get some testing. Because um, again, one of the biggest problems here is if you hit your devices too hard and they're an embedded chip, the whole device is just going to DOS itself and die. So this will allow you to put it on more robust hardware and really hammer that with with burp or something and uh, save yourself a lot of time. So, the ugliest slide in my deck because of pictures. Uh, man in the middling 
IoT devices. This also throws people for a loop sometimes. Uh, this is usually needing hardware, so wireless setups, you can do this yourself with host APD. Uh, so host APD runs on a machine and you have one or two network uh, connections in it, wireless network jacks, and basically one turns into a wireless access point and you set it up and now you set the device to connect to that and it will funnel through the machine to either an ethernet or another wireless access point that you have set up to get your internet access and you can run things like Wireshark then to man in the middle of the device and all you really need is either an ethernet and a wireless card on your machine or I usually plug in a couple of just wireless dongles and jack those in and that makes it easy. You can do overkill with a Hack5 Pineapple uh, which host APD can be a pain sometimes to get working uh, as long if you're not using the same environment over and over again. Hack5 Pineapple actually is pretty slick. Uh, it's very set and forget it most of the times. Uh, so that will do all that host APD for you and you just plug it in uh, to a laptop that has internet and it's going to funnel all that data right out for you. So it takes a little bit of that workout. Plus they look stylish. Uh, for wired setups you have Throwing Star LAN taps which are cheap, about 20 bucks. Hack 5 plunder bugs which are about 70 bucks and that's ethernet on both sides and then a USB-C cable that goes out. Uh, but the Hack 5 plunder bug actually is an active or passive device and I have it error out on me a lot and I seem to spend more time troubleshooting the plunder bug than I do trying to test the device. So I went and bought this shark tap uh, on Amazon. They're about 170 bucks, which is a little more spendy, but it allows the, the connection through. It does a PoE pass through, which is really nice because a lot of IoT devices are PoE, and you get up to gigabit tap. Um, so that's really nice. It all comes out on one tap. So does the plunder bug. The throwing star land tap actually doesn't, so it goes directly through, but you get uh, data for one side, so transmit out and transmit in come on different connections. So you actually have two, to have two ethernet cables plugging into your laptops to get full duplex on that to, to read all the data, which is very bizarre. Um, for, for the hardware, what it is, it's very small and it's very cheap, so that's good. And if you're hiding this in a network closet, that might be fine. But for our testing, I really recommend the Shark Tap. So, honorable mention, it looks like Hack5 just upgraded the, uh, the pineapples. I'm not in any way affiliated with them or getting money for this. I just thought the new pineapple has a uh, special hardware board for it that's a Kismet, Kismet style. And you can get lights, and it just looks damn cool. So I thought I'd point that out. If you're on site, go pick one up, because I'm certainly going to. Alright, so some packet capture notes. Uh, you want to look for clear text communication. You want to look for data going to third parties, because again, anything going out third party, you kind of want to figure out what's being sent and why. Uh, people love selling your data and try to figure out what they're selling. Uh, for any encrypted data, check to see if it's asymmetric or symmetric. Uh, if it happens to be a symmetric encryption, uh, you might have that decryption key on the device, and that's very neat. You can decrypt on both sides and see what they're sending. Um, and also look for strange connections that can't be explained. I've actually tested a couple devices in my career that when I fired it up, uh, I left it for 30 days and 20 some days later, uh, it does this weird connection out. One tripped me off because I went to a university, I think it was in the Philippines. Uh, and it turns out it was a compromised device out there and the, the base device had been compromised and was calling back home uh, with its shell. So supply chain attacks like that do happen. Uh, and if you're doing a pen test on it, or if you're doing this to look to see if you want the devices in your network, I strongly recommend running, running a packet capture at least 30 days uh, to see if anything weird goes on. And that can be pre-setup and setup devices. I prefer running it on both. So getting kind of to the end here, and I haven't been running a timer, so I hope I'm doing okay on time. Uh, hardware testing. The first rule of hardware testing is you will destroy at least one device. For pen testing or bug bounty, I recommend three devices, one to test with and normal, f two for normal user capacity, because I get failed devices quite a bit, especially when they're new. Uh, if you request just one device, it's pretty common to get one that's dead on arrival. Um, so, uh, so the one is for normal user testing, actually, but two is for destructive hardware testing, because you'll probably blow one up. 
Uh, if you only have one device, leave all hardware testing until the end. Set expectations that retesting is going to be out the window because, again, you might blow up the device. And once you start soldering on it, it's probably not going to operate the same way that it was supposed to anyway. Um, the second rule of hardware testing is don't test hardware if you don't know what you're doing. I cannot stress this enough. If somebody tells you in a consulting capacity, uh, do this test and you don't know how to do hardware testing, say that you can't do hardware testing because you will smoke the device and there's nothing that ruins your credibility faster than having to ask for a bunch of devices because you missoldered soldered something and then if you get another one and you screw up again and another one and you screw up again, you're going to look like an idiot. Um, so as we can see, uh, if you screw up some soldering stuff, you can, when you power the board up, you can uh, blow the brains out of the board. Um, image source from a hardware uh, engineer, electrical engineer. But I will go over some of the hardware attacks so you're aware of them. Uh, and then you can go and dig in, and I'll talk about a little bit about uh, some training courses that are out there for you as well. So some hardware attacks that you want to look at, uh, dumping firmware. So you can dump the firmware directly off of the chips that are on the board if you pull it out. Uh, so what you want to do with that is there's things called chip clips. And you have the chip on the board, and this clip literally clips around it. And when the board is running, you can pull that data off um, and dump that firmware and then just do exactly what we did and extract that firmware and look at it. That way, if they had flashed anything on there that the update isn't getting, you're going to get that as well. In most cases, sometimes there's security hardware chips that, that block some things, but that's a little more rare. Uh, then there's also uh, UART and JTAG to gain interactive consoles. So these are test leads that are put on a board uh, for when they're developing the actual hardware. Theoretically, in production, they should burn those off so they should fail and never be operable on a production board. But that's only starting to really come to, to play in major hardware. You still see a lot of it available because if you send something back, they want to be able to hook into it and see what, what went wrong with it. So a lot of times they leave those open. And just kind of looking at what I'm talking about with that, so here's on a motherboard, actually a network board. Uh, so here down here is the JTAG connectors. So you've seen them working on desktop computers, I'm sure, before. Uh, these ones are very nice. They're easy to connect to with test leads. That's rarely the case. Again, this is meant for somebody to figure out. A lot of times you get by the way, scrolling through here, you can see how complex this can get. Do, 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 do. And I missed it. So here's some of the JTAGs without pins. So you get those. But even then, sometimes you get these nice solder points that you can solder to. Sometimes you don't. I've actually gotten some JTAGs that if you see down here these tiny little dots with the little lines, sometimes it's those little suckers and getting access onto those can be very difficult because you can really burn up the board with that. Uh, so you want these little pins here or something that you can solder to. But basically you have to solder heads onto a bunch of different JTAGs and these are grouped together nicely and marked. Sometimes these pins are going to be all over your board randomly and you'll see like JTAG 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, and a lot of times you've got to actually go and uh, map all these out. And there's the Adify board, which is a really nice board for finding small amounts. And basically it connects a bunch of leads together and it tries different combinations until it finds a correct uh, console. Uh, you get a, a valid connection. JTAGulator is a bigger version of that. I believe it's made by Grand Idea Studios, Joe Grand, uh, but it's a much bigger, I think it goes, and I'm totally guessing here, I believe it's 128 possible connections. So you can really map out a large board and find multiple different connections, because you might actually get multiple consoles, because what you're talking to is, you're talking to these big chips. Uh, so you might actually be able to talk to multiple different chips. So think on a, on a router, I mean one could be the firmware, one might be an actual BIOS or something. Uh, so you can find different things and access different components. Um, so the Xbox 360 has quite a few uh, uh, different components that you can talk to, uh, which is kind of interesting to, to kind of man in the middle of the hardware even, which is literally what you can do with this. So, 
So another thing to check for is stealable memory chips. So sometimes if you're on a board, you can steal the SD microchip and just pull it out, plug it into your laptop, and uh, look at the file system as well. And it's kind of surprising how many times you bust something open and there's just an SD little mini SD card sitting inside, uh, which is also bad for how long your device is going to last because if you've run SD cards active read writes for a while, you know how quickly those burn out. Um, so looking at that and seeing is that actually going to be a stable device for over the long period of time, uh, you might actually have a finding right there. Um, and then also check the device shell for functional purposes. So if we're thinking about a camera, um, security cameras like those little mini domes that you see at uh, restaurants and stuff, they should theoretically have a hole drilled in the ceiling and go up so nobody can just cut the cable. But if you see a lot of those cameras, you can actually see the cable coming out and people can just unscrew them or cut the cable. That's a bad design. So if you're doing an actual pen test on this, you should have that hardened. Uh, the cable should be cut resistant and it should be hidden so that it can't be attacked. Um, and I'm just kind of talking about some of the essential tools. Uh, Adify boards have really taken over. So Adify is a group, I believe they're a consulting company, but they do really good training and they made this Adify board. Uh, the JTagulator is amazing, but it's expensive. I think it's 200 bucks. The Adify board is something like 50 or 60 bucks. And the Adify board can not only find those uh, UART and JTAG connections, it can actually fire up the console connections as well, uh, all in one. Um, which is really nice. Although I will say I always recommend the USB to TTL UART device connections as well. I personally don't like to use my Adify board to do the console connections just because the longer it's plugged in the more chance that I'm going to fry it if you bump something. Uh, so I always switch the USB to TTL UART devices. They're ten dollars on Amazon if you buy them at one packs. You can go on like AliExpress and buy 50 packs for dirt cheap. They're like 50 cents a piece. So I literally just have a whole stack of them sitting in a closet and I pull them out and I fry them occasionally. Uh, so much easier to fry that. And ironically, they fry and don't actually mess up the board. I've never actually had one fry the product I'm testing. But these little things do burn themselves out. I also recommend a multimeter to see where power is going and if you smoke the device. Uh, and a cheap USB logic analyzer. This is to figure out your baud rate. This is one of those things that you'll want training on and pretty much every training will figure it out. But to get the console connections, you need to know the baud rate uh, to get the connection to actually function. So knowing how to use a logic analyzer to get that is very important. Otherwise, you're never gonna get a console and you're gonna be confused of why. You can try to guess and there are some standards, but uh, it's not gonna be as good as you want. And then those chip clips that I was talking about where you can chip over to download the firmwares, uh, there is a large number of those, and some of them, actually many of them, look the same. You have to read the specification on the ch for the chips themselves that you're going to clip to see what kind of format they are. If you clip the wrong one, even if the clips look the same, you clip the wrong one, you've just fried the chip, which fried your product, and now you've got to ask your customer for a new board. And again, you do that enough times and they're not going to be happy. So. You'll need various chip clips and you'll need to keep them marked so you know exactly which ones are which so you're not smoking your customer's hardware. And then some hardware hacking resources. Uh, I always recommend start with an Electronics 101 book and then get into Arduino hardware hacking. Do not learn on your customers. Uh, the great thing about pen testing is usually you can learn on the job. With hardware hacking, uh, you will not be happy, and neither will your customer, and neither will your employer when they have to explain that you're smoking hundred, two hundred, thousand, ten thousand dollar devices. Uh, not good. Um, so get the Electronics 101, learn basic circuits, learn how to make basic circuits, series, parallel, all that kind of stuff. Very important uh, to know how to not short circuit devices and fry them. And then the Arduino stuff is getting into that micro hardware and start building out some circuits yourself and start messing with some cheap devices that you go buy at a thrift store uh, and you can start testing those. And then learning soldering is incredibly important. A bad solder will fry things. Getting a board too hot will destroy the whole board. And then surface mount soldering is much more important nowadays than it used to be. And surface mount soldering is a whole other thing that if you heat the board too much, you can cause problems. Uh, if you don't have a surface mount soldering kit, which like I don't, uh, it can be tricky. If you do have one, that's great, but otherwise people do these bake tricks and stuff where you bake the boards or heat them up with blow dryers and all sorts of stuff. Those can go catastrophically wrong if you don't know what you're doing.
So learn regular soldering and learn surface mount soldering. And the thing I will tell you, if you don't know surface mount soldering, don't try to surface mount solder on a customer board because, again, it's going to go bad. Um, free training resources. Black Hills InfoSec has some excellent resources in their blog for how to get started in hardware hacking. I believe they came out last year, but maybe it was 2019. Uh, one of their people really went through and started to learn it and wrote everything up. It's great. Adify's blog, where the Adify board comes from, they have some great blog articles as well. Um, you just have to dig through both to find the IoT stuff. Paid training. Adify has what I've heard is the best course in the industry for offensive IoT hardware hacking. Uh, I believe it's about $1,000. They have a remote and in, in person. The remote just came because of last year, obviously, with the, with the pandemic. But they will ship you the stuff if you're not comfortable going on site. They will ship it to you and you can go through the course uh, and learn. You'll get their Adify board and all that kind of stuff. Joe Grand with Grand Idea Studio, he has an excellent class as well. He taught it at Black Hat for many years uh, and he'd bring it to smaller cons as well. I took that personally several years ago, loved it. Um, teaches you everything you need to know to at least get your feet wet and not smoke every piece of hardware you get through. Uh, but he has none currently scheduled, whereas Adify does. So I highly recommend both of those. So, and this is my talk, and I hope I didn't go over time or under time too much, but I hope you all learned things. And if you ever need to get a hold of me, I am available on Twitter for at EopolSniper, uh, or if you know how, to, know how to search, you will be able to find me. Uh, and come and look me up and uh, hit me up with any questions you have. Thank you, and have a good day.